Hello and welcome back uh, to part two of my interview with Matt Elgren and Clay Christensen. Uh, the overall theme of this podcast as it's sort of unfolding, it's about belief, it's about doubt, but mostly it's about families, about uh, mixed faith families and how difficult mixed faith families can be, particularly in this case for the non-believers. We'll have some believers on sometime as well as we've had in the past to talk about their perspective because it's not always a picnic for them either. But in this case, Matt and I were good friends at Microsoft. We both sort of went through our early faith crises together. Uh, Matt's been, as, as we listened in the first segment, it's been about 15 years now where Matt's been sort of, from my perspective, the good soldier supporting his believing wife, Lori, as she... Um, as she remains faithful, Matt sort of keeping his doubts and questions uh, to himself, raising children in the church, um, and just doing all he can to put the family first, and in his case, to have his doubts and his own concerns be secondary. And how, as we ended so beautifully last segment, Matt talking about how he's glad, and uh, he, he feels like it was a sacrifice worth making to have a happy and a healthy family, and not a perfect family, but one that he feels proud to have been a part of. So that's been uh, that's been part one, and it's been beautiful. And what's really fun is how all these stories sort of weave together. So, uh, Matt, let's have you pick up just a tiny bit since right. we last yeah. hour was about your perspective. I got a, an email or a phone call from you a few weeks ago. Right. So talk about what it was like when... You first saw some things happening. First, talk about what Clay was like from your perspective um, prior to hearing that things were changing for him. And then what it was like to hear that things uh, might be changing for Clay, the the brother of your wife, uh, active in the church for 50 yeah. plus years, church employee for seven, um, TBM until six weeks ago. Um, talk about Good. what that was like for you. So, first, you were pretty excited when you yeah, talked to me. It's <laughs> it, well, you know, it's kind of like it's out of it's an out of the blue kind of experience. In the same way that it was out of the blue for you to just oh, I should have looked into this before, and all of a sudden, bam! For me to get that call from you was the last thing I expected. How did the call come? I'm at work in the office, just working away, and I get a call from Clay. And, and this he is says, he, October? Well, well, I'll just say, I felt like Clay was being guarded. November somewhat. 12th. Yeah. It was November 12th. November 12th. And we had talked to, I was being guarded. I was talking about Xbox. We were talking, yeah, Clay. That's a family thing. Clay called to say, you know, hey, maybe we want to buy another couple of Xboxes for the fam, for the family vacation. <laughs> that's how we stay but, close over the years. That's so right. So it's been kind of superficial, surface level. Right. All our kids, our kids all play Xbox together, and they it's kept the family close, even though we. So video games cities. keeping yes. keeping part part you know mixed right. families. That's right. Playing together. Halo, playing Halo <laughs> online, and, and yeah. playing video games together has kept my family here, and and it felt it felt like we're together all the time. That's right. Okay, so, yeah. so you so you get a call, your work. Yeah. So Clay's asking me, and this had, kind of had started the night before. I almost thought at first I thought Clay had bum dialed me. Uh, the night before, because the way Did he you answered, it out? Tended I'm like, like going, no, no, hello? I didn't want to talk to him when he was at home. Yeah, like, we wouldn't be I didn't, I didn't, under, I didn't know what was going on. I'm like, so we start talking about Xbox. All of a sudden, he starts, oh, hey, uh, <laughs> hey, you know, what like... about the Xbox? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that's how the night before, and then the next day, he calls me, kind of in a follow up conversation. I had gone to the store and copied, sent him some pricing and stuff like that, and I thought he was kind of calling back about that. But very quickly, he was like, I could tell he was like, something else was coming. And then he <laughs> says, Matt, why did you stop believing in the church? Or how did you, how did you find out the church wasn't true? Yeah, he was more positive than that. And I was like, is this, am I being entrapped here? <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, immediately I, I started really feeling comfortable with what Clay was asking me. And I just told him. And I did tell him right away, you're you're the first one in my family that's actually asked me that question. How did it feel to have someone reach out? I was like... Yeah, so 15 years, Yeah, no one's ever asked you what... No one's ever asked me. I've had some things from my mother basically lamenting me, but not really wanting to know why 
And that is that is the experience. Yeah. Parents don't want to know. No. Siblings don't want to know. Ward members don't want to know. They talk to each other about it, but you don't. They, they don't, don't talk to you ever about want it. to talk to you. Isn't that weird? I think. Very and again, I remember feeling the same way. I don't remember. I told you this, but as soon as I found out a mission leader, ward mission leader, in my mission was reading Sunstone, we ran away. As yeah. missionaries. Yeah, we did it too. We didn't want to talk to him. Yeah. We didn't yeah. want to help him. Right. We were like, dude, yeah. you're messed up. Yeah. That's kind of how we we. Yeah. It didn't matter that we were supposed to work with him every week or that he was part of our the ward and whatever. <laughs> or a family member. Because there are some <laughs> things that are just like so taboo that you don't know what else to do. Yeah. So I kind of, I really understand that. Yeah. And, and that's why, and I also was like not demanding that people hear me. Right. Yeah. It's kind of a respect. You got to respect people's desires not to talk about stuff. Yeah. To some extent, especially if you have to live with them. How do you view Clay up until that point? So, as I said early on in the previous hour, I had this perspective of Clay that he was like, in some ways, an ideal for me because I could see that he was, and he, I know, I could tell he excelled at everything he did. Um, and I looked up to him. He was a couple years older than me, and in high school, two years is a lot of time, a lot of space, and he was the older guy, and. Then once I joined the family, he's the guy that was in the Navy. And Clay, I don't want to steal your thunder. You'll no, tell it's the okay. Story. No, from your perspective. But we'll so much of my kids adore their Uncle Clay. And for good reason. Uh, he is a stand-up guy. He's a model American, a model Mormon, a model dad in so many ways. And he spent time just playing Xbox with these kids more than any other any any other parent in the in the family and that's something to you know i and i've told i told clay when we were initially talking that i was hopeful that this will change our family that his his experience will change our family because of the great amount of respect so that maybe Lori would come to see things maybe more. Lori, the grandkids, this, yeah. all these things. This is very dangerous space we're talking in right now. And Clay can tell you about this. Uh, it's he, it's weird to go from, for me, it was like a long-term thing where I was the shady guy. I was a guy no one really wanted to talk to. And I was the uncle that was dark and brooding. And Clay was like the gregarious, the fun-loving the you faithful, know, succeeding devout, in life, successful. creating his, at his job, going success after success, uh, be like Uncle Clay. And, and I it, know, especially my oldest daughter, really, really adores him. And to hear that he's having this experience to me was just other. It was like science fiction. I don't know. How but there's got to be a sense of joy for you. To me, it was a like validation, it was euphoria. I'll just you're oh, probably yeah, like clicking your forward. heels, dancing the happy dance in your office, and also anxiety because the thing is, is that now uh, this means that some things are going to get reopened that have been just kind of had the pressure cooker thing on them for years now, because Clay is not the kind of person that will sit back and not say what he thinks, <laughs> and. I was simultaneously like euphoric that this could mean we might make progress as a family to be closer and fearful that this could actually backlash in a big way. Yeah. Because, so, because even now, and I didn't talk about this last yeah. episode, you've stayed largely quiet in many ways for a long time, but you're not now. Right. So this well, interview well, I'm willing to talk here, but you know, John, I had not even, I haven't even talked to you until we got to this interview. I'm still in that mode of, I told Larry I was coming here. To, I was coming to meet with you as a friend. I still have to tell her that we're doing this interview. Yeah, and definitely, the family's going to find out that Clay and I are doing this together, and that's something ahead of us. Though I don't know. Well, what we don't want to ruin Christmas. I mean, it's yeah. the twenty second of December. We'll put this out. So after we'll do Christmas. it after yeah. Christmas. Okay. But but Chris for you, it was, it was Matt. For you, it was ambivalent. It was part euphoric. And part scary. Yeah. yeah. Ambivalence is the right word. Yeah. But this is how it happens. But nothing you would never fall, guess. You know? Yeah. Now, instead of one domino falling, there's been two. Right. All right, Clay. So it's time to switch to your story. And uh, and uh, I think it's fun to have framed it in Matt's story. So, but let's, yeah, let's, let's rewind. 
let's go back. Let's talk about your your story. Well, I do want to start at the beginning because, you know, my story is a story of, uh, you know, someone who grew up in the church. And really, three three months ago, I would have told you that I owe just about everything I am to the family, to growing up in the church. Everything about me, I am thankful to the church for, for making me who I am. Um, and I would be really ungrateful if I didn't acknowledge that. Um, I have to tell you that I grew up, you know about my sister, my, my mom, my dad, Midvale, uh, and my dad was never around as a youth. I mean, I knew that he was busy working and he was out a lot. And I remember, I remember up until, well, like, they got divorced when I was 16 and he just, he was not at home. And I knew that he was very not interested in the church, never, never did anything at the church. But I remember praying every night that they wouldn't get divorced because this is what kids do. They don't want their parents to get divorced. But, but they got divorced. So now my mom's single mom, young mom, she's only 20 years older than me. And, uh, you know, I've got a younger sister and a younger brother, and we're there in Midville. And the love that we got from our ward, the, the ward members, the, uh, the, the bishop, I went home teaching with the state president. I mean, that we just felt at home, we felt loved. I, know, I don't ever feel like I had a, a, a disadvantaged youth because of <coughs> The other reason is because of my grandparents. My grandpa and grandma, Merlin and Lyle Ashman, uh, from, from Redmond, Utah. I spent every minute that I could be down there, working on the farm, uh, being with them. My grandma was a school teacher. My grandpa was a farmer, and he had a tax preparation business. And they are just the most wonderful people that, that could ever be. I'm, I'm wearing a suit today because my grandma would have expected me to wear a suit. <laughs> she would have. She's and passed away? She has. Okay. And, uh, you know, so this is for her. I, I, uh, so a weird question. Yeah. Would you have been able to do this interview if they were still alive? I would have. Or would that have kept you, like um, Matt, more quiet? And this is, like Matt says, with my grandparents, I, if I, I would have driven down to talk to him about it. Okay. But I felt like we had that good of a relationship. Good. That's nice. Yeah. Um, growing up, you know, we always heard the stories. Well, I just, you know, growing up, and spending as much time as I did in Redmond, Utah, um, you just you learned about the church. This is you know everyone called each other bishop, and I, I knew who the current bishop was, but you know my grandpa was bishop this, bishop that, and you just all the former the, bishops. Yeah, yeah. The, the church just permeates that small town, and you know my dad's family lived there too, and we they weren't we weren't as close to them. We didn't spend as much time with them, and I but when we'd go visit them, you know you'd smell coffee and tobacco. And even as a kid, I knew something's off. That's, that's not right. Um, in your dad's family. In my dad's family. And so there was kind of a, a weirdness there that it's hard to describe. And it's sad. But, um, but the closeness that we had with my grandparents was because they were such loving people. But also that whole, the church just permeated the whole thing. So we would, I grew up, my great-grandma was still alive. And we'd go down to her tiny little house, hear the stories. We, I knew about polygamy. You know, my, my story is is not as tied to the church history, but certainly steeped in, I knew of my ancestors. I knew of my ancestors that came from Denmark. My grandma would say, wow, we've been to Denmark, and I can't imagine leaving there. And so, because it's so beautiful there. And and so I knew that my, my ancestors had, had sacrificed for the church coming to Utah and, and all that they had done. And and just how important that was. You know, we told the story, or, you know, I would hear the story of how my grandfather, you know, grew up maybe not so active, but we didn't really talk about that, just kind of hushed tones. But my great-grandfather, uh, Elmer Nelson, had kind of taken my grandfather under his wing, taught him how to be a good member of the church, and just what a blessing that was for our family. And it was. It was a, it was a wonderful blessing. Our family is super close because of the church and what that taught him and, and, how, and where it went. Um, So, so you know, I I never felt like I like I wasn't loved. I was take care of. I just the church and my family I had a great a great childhood, a great youth, and I uh, experienced when I was a youth. You know, I never questioned that I was going to go on a mission. 
because one of my absolute earliest memories was of my grandma asking me if I was going to go on a mission. And I remember her asking me, hey, are, are you going to go on a mission when you get older? And I said, well, grandma, that's a long ways off. Uh, she said, well, it'll be here before you know it. And I said, well, yeah, grandma, I'm going to go. And, you know, I know it was a long, I know I was young because I was standing in the back seat of a car talking to her, having that conversation. I remember that like it was, like it was yesterday. And so from that moment on, I would never have wanted to do anything to disappoint my grandparents. And they're just, and, and I went on a mission and I went on a mission to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I loved my mission experience. Um, you know, I wasn't the perfect kid in high school. I went to seminary, graduated from seminary back when it was easy to graduate. Um, I, I, I just kind of had the normal, I read the Book of Mormon once, just felt like I never had any doubt that the church wasn't true. I just, just kind of felt lucky to be a member and felt blessed that I had been born into it. Went on my mission, uh, came back from my mission and I, uh, went to the University of Utah. I was in our Navy ROTC graduate. And when I got back from my mission, I met my, my wife, uh, her name's Brenda Layton and come to find out she's descendant of Joseph Smith. Uh, you know, we talked about the fact she's descended Joseph Smith. She's descended Joseph Smith through Sarah through Sylvie, Lyon. No, Sylvia, Sylvia Sessions. Sessions Lyon. Right? And yeah, yeah. And you know, I thought that was great. I'm kind of naively. I'm not paying attention to any of these clues that I'm picking up during my <laughs> during as I, that I'm coming across. You know, her family kind of talked about it. Said, well, you know, she's related to Sylvia Sessions, but you know, don't kind of don't really talk about that. And naively, I thought, well, why wouldn't you talk about that? That's, that's great. Well, you find out that Sylvia Sessions was married to someone else. It's polyandry. It's not a, it's not a really good story. So Joseph had a child with, with Sylvia Sessions. With Sylvia while, while she, she was, was married, married to another man. Yeah. And it's... Would your family have known that story and passed that down? Well, her family did. Yeah, absolutely. And, family, and they talked yeah. about it. In fact, we told that to our children. And we said, well, you know, people... It makes people uncomfortable for some reason, but but we still talked about it. Yeah, and my son said it to his seminary teacher, like, "Hey, you know, I'm related to Joseph Smith." And the seminary teacher told him, eh, "No, that's not possible. He didn't have many children with his, with his, with his plural wives." <laughs> and and you know that he thought that was kind of odd, but we said, "Well, you know, people people are uncomfortable with that." But I never thought about it. You know, people talk about uh, the shelf. I am here to tell you, I never had anything on my shelf. There was, <laughs> you wouldn't allow anything to well, be considered to I, even the need to if, go on the shelf. If you believe yeah. that the church is true and that Joseph Smith is a prophet, there's no, there's no shelf. How, how can you have a shelf? There's nothing to put on it because no. it's all true, right? Yeah. And, I, yeah. and I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say that now. So you, you feel like for 51 years you didn't have a shelf? Yeah, never had a shelf. That's amazing. <laughs> and people that know me, people that know me, will tell you that that's true. So what? So I mean, surely you knew Matt was questioning stuff. You've probably heard about internet, and I mean, you know, it's 2015 December. CES letter's been around a couple of years. Mormon thinks been around longer than that. Mormon stories has been I around longer than that. I at the church, and everyone talked about John De, Joel DeLynn's brother, John. Did you hear about him? He's apostate. No, I didn't know. That's too bad for Joel. I thought. <laughs> Sorry for Joel, I feel bad. <laughs> and Matt, I, you know, Matt, I just felt like you, you're somebody that wants to drink coffee and drink beer and just doesn't care about the church. And it was such a foreign concept to me that I could never, I didn't, you know, didn't know. Did, yeah. did and, and what kept you from ever questioning or thinking about the truth claims of the church and the potential problems with history and those sorts of things. Well, this is, this is why it's even more embarrassing than that. Let me, not, let me not answer that question by going back and tell you all these other times where I could have, <laughs> could have had a clue. I was in the Navy. We were stationed in Spain and small branch. So I, I mention that because I'm not thinking that I'm that great of a person, but I was the counselor in the branch presidency. And, you know, there was a small branch. And the president of the branch was one of the first people to get the priesthood. He's black, black guy. One of the first people to get the priesthood. And, and I just thought, Hey, this is great. One of the first I, black Mormons to get, to the, get priesthood? the priesthood. Okay. Yeah. And he was a great guy. But I remember, I remember 
the reaction on my grandparents. I remember two reactions about church. When David O. McKay died, seeing my grandma cry, and just having that really touch me. And then the other time, their joy, their excitement about black skinning the priesthood. And I knew enough that there was something about the preexistence and black people hadn't been worthy. And I, it didn't, looking back on it now, I didn't like it. But I thought, well, I don't understand that. That's, but it is, that's the gospel, you know, it's, it's true. And, you know, I'm somebody who enjoys, I love reading history. I didn't take Institute in college, but just a couple times. But I had read the Institute Manual, Church History in the Fullness of Times. So I knew church history. I've been to all of the church history sites, some of them twice, and never heard any of the behind the scenes story that they talk about. Well, let's talk about Carthage Jail. I never knew that at Carthage Jail, Joseph Smith had shot three people, killed two of them. I learned that a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. Uh, that uh, there's just so much about Did church history. Did he drink wine? Yeah, I didn't know about him drinking wine. Before he died, then no. before he died. I, I didn't know that he uh, had practiced, well, that he'd had uh, relations with Fanny Alger before the revolution revelations about about this plural marriage. So either he's having an adulterous relationship yeah. or inexplicably yeah. he's beginning polygamy before he even is supposed to receive the revelation yeah. to start practicing polygamy. I don't know any of this. <laughs> I'm totally... And, but I, I consider myself somebody who's, who loves reading history. I study history all the time, read all kinds of biographies. Um, I had read the book about John D. Lee, and it talks about all about the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And, you know, so I knew that there was something going on there where, oh, Brigham Young supposedly knew about it. And I, I had just reconciled in my mind that, hey, it, it, it's... If the church is true, if the church is true, the then this is not a problem. <laughs> exactly. And, and I'll tell you, you know, I, like I said, I was in the Navy. I was on active duty for nine years. Came back. As a what? A, as an officer doing electronic reconnaissance. Okay. And, uh, and the last time, or the last part of my Navy time, I went to, I was a recruiter here in Utah. And I got an MBA at the University of Utah. And then I went into consulting. And we moved to Minnesota. So most of my adult life, I've lived outside of the state. So this is the thing. I'm not somebody who's absolute, unquestioning Mormon living in Utah County or South Jordan. I'm out in the world doing things, running across people. I was in the Navy on active duty. I retired from the reserves just a couple years ago. Never tried alcohol. Never drank coffee. I was the designated driver and happy to tell people about the church. I bore my testimony on four continents <laughs> and and never you know so what what is some of the other things that you know like I said I, I I knew about these things I read about the biographies and the and the history of the church but it never really struck me I even went to the British Museum and saw the Rosetta Stone <laughs> and I knew the whole story about that. 1805, they find it in Rosetta, Egypt. They take it back. It gets, in 1837, the, the secret of hieroglyphics are unlocked. So we can read hieroglyphics. And, and I, had I, you known the history of the Joseph Smith's papyri at all? Or? Well, only that, they're, that the papyri are in the scriptures and that this is the translation. Yeah. I'm embarrassed that I never said, you never does this the translation... Yeah. I always just assumed that the translation was correct or somebody would have told me. <laughs> Why wouldn't somebody talk about the fact Why wouldn't somebody talk about the fact that the, the, the translations of the of the uh, papyri are wrong? That they're not even close. They're, I, I don't know why I never thought about that. Because I, like I said, I'm somebody that enjoys history and and uh, up till up till recently, I've never thought about it. Did I answer your question? Yeah, so you had you got married. What's your wife's name? Oh, Brenda, Brenda Layton. Oh, oh, that's right. That's so let's right. talk about that too, because this is also part of the somehow uh, <clears throat> cognitive dissonance that was going on. Because I married a descendant of Joseph Smith, whose father had fallen away from the church. Mother and father had both fallen away from the church. Um, Richard Layton, fantastic, great guy, just a, a nice guy, and much like Matt had fallen away from the church, but did not talk about it. it. Did not try to convince us to leave. 
to, to not, he wasn't constantly telling us, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. My wife's sister had left the church when she was a, a youth. And I'll, I'll mention some things. Well, I'm not really telling it in chronological order, but since in the last six weeks, we found out from her that, you know, she read about the church and figured out when she was in high school. And it's like, hey, welcome, welcome to the club, mm-hmm. she told her, you know. But she didn't tell you. She didn't time. tell us. Yeah. And so I'm just telling, I'm asking people, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you let me know? Clay asked me the same question. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> He's like, why didn't you tell me? Ten like, years well, ago. How do you think you would have reacted if I had told you? I don't know how I would have reacted, and that's <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. The, that's the question. How how would I have reacted if I hadn't come the way it did? Yeah. Okay. So you you married Brenda Layton. Brenda, you worked in the Navy for many years. Had had my daughter and son. Two two children. Two son. Two children. Um, eventually, ended up working for the church. Came, yeah, I was like I said. I went after I got my MBA. We moved to Minnesota, and I was a consultant. Started doing software consulting, and for several years I did that. Worked in the software industry, and fun story there is I met a lot of folks that asked me a lot of questions about the about the church, and you know, in the last six weeks, in the last six weeks I've talked to a lot of those folks, a lot of my friends. They asked me about the church. Back then. And, and I was naively thinking that they were genuinely interested in the church. And I started telling them. You know, I would tell them my testimony, tell them what I knew about the church. And they were too polite to say, hey, Clay, we found this on the internet. What about this? No. Their questions <laughs> were always just super polite. And these were non-Mormons. Non-Mormons. And they're scared to talk to you, too. They're scared. Like everybody's scared to talk to everybody about anything, right? The closest thing that any of them did, <laughs> the closest thing that any of, them, any of them did was to say to one of them that was a Mason, gave me the book Mormons and Masonry. And I kind of skimmed through that and I looked at it and I, and uh, it, it isn't really a, a bad book. It's written... Yeah. It's not written to say, no, it's oh, history. Mormons stole everything from Masonry. It's just, it's just a history. Yeah. And, and as someone who believed that the temple ceremony came from the Temple of Solomon and so did Masonry, mm-hmm. I had no problem with that. Yeah. Now, we now know that that's not true, that you know, Masonry came from medieval Europe. And, but at the time, I never had a problem with the fact that there were sim- similarities. And in fact, it was faith prone. It's like, well, oh, it comes from the Temple of Solomon. It must be, must be true. Yeah. Okay, so, so you had Teflon. You just no, absolutely. You weren't even going to think about the possibility that it wasn't true. And I, I don't, and none of this evidence, sort of confirmation bias. Everything that you learned confirmed to you what you already knew, which was that it was true. And any evidence that could ever lead you to question, you uh, what evidence did not pay attention to? I, I didn't see any evidence. <laughs> I see no evidence here. I, <laughs> I would have been embarrassed. I would be embarrassed if I. If I thought that I looked back on my on my life and I was as some people are, you know, close my ears and saying, La la, I don't want to hear. Yeah. I never felt like there was a moment where I said, I don't want to hear the truth. I never do. I never did. But I wasn't looking for the truth. You felt like you were I, open. I had the truth. You, you felt like you're open to Absolutely. the truth, but you just started happen to already have it. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm about telling other people what the truth Amen, is. Brother Dylan. I'm about sharing it with other people. <laughs> helping people have the same joy that I have. Because okay. I have nothing but um, appreciation and thankfulness for all the blessings that I have from being a member of the church. And and working yeah. at the church, you working seemed at the really church. insistent to oh, want yeah. to say that by the end. Yes, let me say this unequivocally. My time at the church, I loved it. And anyone that knows me from there, they will know that I worked like crazy there. I mean, I was the last car in the parking lot many, many nights. And you feel and like you had a great experience. Great right? experience. Even like it was a great place to work. Fantastic experience. It was a great place to work. <laughs> um, there were things that I would say, oh, you got to have a strong testimony because you're going to come in and work hard. And, and you're going to realize that there's a, an aspect of the church that's a business aspect. I had no problem with that. Loved working for your brother. And... Uh, up until three months ago, and I had said this to people, if the church called me and said, Clay, we need you, I would have come. And, and I mean that. And, and I haven't worked for the church for three years. And I'm glad that there's enough distance because I don't want people to think, oh, I left the church because of finding out it's not true. Or because uh, of working there. Yeah, because yeah. of working there. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I would go back. Now, they won't want me probably, <clears throat> but I would go back and work there tomorrow and help them in any way just because I'm a professional. So no, for, no ill feelings about that at all. So just for fun, tell tell us how awesome it is to work for my brother. 
<laughs> well, he's just a, he's a good guy, and he's got a lot of ideas, and uh, he's passionate about his about the work. And I, I just he's a great guy. <laughs> um, okay, now honestly, did you have? Is there anything you can or are able to talk about about all the stuff happening over the past ten years? On the Mormon internet, did you have any visibility into that? Did What's you know the Mormon what? internet? You I, didn't. I knew that you had you, seriously. I knew that you were had fallen away from the church. You didn't know about the podcasts out there. You didn't no. know about Mormon Think website about no. CES letter about. No. You didn't know about the essays that were being developed. No. <laughs> <laughs> well. I want to tell a little, a little more chronologically how I, how I came okay. to start noticing things. Okay. But I can honestly tell you, I was absolutely oblivious. I, I knew there was an anti-Mormon thing going on. I had heard the name Sandra Tanner before. But just not even, it didn't even register. I just knew there was a whole anti-Mormon culture out there that I wasn't interested in, didn't need in my life, and wasn't aware of it. And, and honestly, from Matt, I never got that there was an anti-Mormon culture out there. I didn't think Matt was even in tune with any of that. Partly because Matt stayed quiet, right? Because he was so quiet. Yeah, he right? never came to me and said, hey, Clay, read this. Clay Look at this. He never actually read some of the stuff I wrote on the internet, which thankfully may have disappeared by now. But, <laughs> but you, blog, yeah. you blogged a little bit? I blogged or? some, and I was angry. Was that for Mormon Anarchist? What was that? I had a, a blog called Mormonarchy, and I was actively kind of one of the neg more negative people in the blogger knackle for a while. And then I went off into... Just commenting on posts. Yes. And then I went off into uh, for, uh, Further Light and Knowledge and really love those people. These are internet forums. This is a forum of people that have left the church and that are angry. <laughs> and I was angry. Yeah. And they have a great sense of humor. And I was getting a sense of people that have rich, meaningful lives that I appreciated. And I was writing there things and I exposed myself for who I really was behind my name and at one point I got a call from my dad because I'd read something about my mom and someone noticed and told my dad and not very long after that I stopped writing because I realized this is only this is an this is only hurting but there's this whole thing going yeah. on that Clay was unaware and, of and, and it's was, preventing the silence is preventing anyone from having a chance to sort of right. know a deeper story, right? Sure. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe Larry never told Clay no. or anyone about these kinds of problems that she and I had. The silence is deafening. I knew that. I, 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 now that I think of it, I knew that you had written you had written bad things about the church, and I didn't go look. But not what. Right. And the only thing I remember, seriously, the only specific thing I remember is my mom saying. Matt's talking about his barista. He's just so proud of himself. On Facebook. Coffee. That was on Facebook. And I don't have Facebook, so. Okay, okay. You don't have Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I wonder if like 70% of the church is like you were. Never, like we all, those of us who have been doing this for the past 10 years, we probably, oh, well, lots of people know about Kate Kelly or Dane Women or, you know, Mormon Stories or, you know, I bet most, I bet most active Mormons are just oblivious to all this. I think they are. And we all think, oh, the church is hemorrhaging and we're losing all its members. When in reality, probably 90% of the active members are like you were, completely unaware of all of it and are invincible. Right? Yeah. Is that possible? I think that's what they think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. D newsflash. People aren't watching Mormon stories <laughs> that are going to church. <laughs> right? They're, they're not. They're yeah. just not because they're feeling like, well, I don't know, when you're ready to tell the chronology chronology here, I'll tell you some things some things that were shocking to me. Because as soon as I found it, I started wanting to talk about it. And I quickly realized no, nobody wants to hear this. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let, are you ready? Do you feel like you're ready to start? Like the big question I'm having is what would have you go from being Teflon clay to the cracks starting to open you up to the possibility. All right. So, and you can talk about the stuff that happens in your family before things really start cracking for you. But okay. if, if you feel ready, is there anything else you wanted to well, say? Well, I just, I really want to make sure that people, Love this, the church. people watching this, you weren't looking for a reason to sin. Never looked you for You weren't trying to yeah. cheat on somebody. You didn't want to drink. Yeah. You weren't like, and, and to write, and right now, you weren't today. offended by anybody. Absolutely. Right? And I'll, I'll tell you this quote. <laughs> 
people often say, oh, the church, people aren't perfect, but the, the church is perfect, but people aren't. And I'll tell you what, I, looking back on it now, absolutely the church is not perfect at all. The people made it perfect for me, and they still do. If there's anyone of my neighbors, there's only a handful of neighbors in my ward that aren't members. Um, the people made it great for me. I love it, and I still love them. And this is what hurts me. And this is, I, I want to, I'm still a Christian. And this is what hurts me too when people, they find out this and they immediately turn from the whole thing and throw it all away. The only thing I want to set aside is the things that I found out now that are false. And somehow I want to hold on to the family and friends that I love that are Christian, that are members of the church. Um, that, that matters to me. So yeah, if you, if you want to talk about the, how I came to find this out, I would say the first first person besides Matt that was somewhat close to me that uh, that I found out left the church was a friend of mine uh, that I worked at the church with. We started on the same day and about a year ago I found out out of the blue that he had quit his job at the church and was and, and had left the church completely. Now uh, that was pretty shocking to me because I knew he was about as devout as I was. I mean I knew he was super solid. And he's a great guy. And he called me and was talking about work. And I, and I, you know, I said, hey, we got to get together to lunch. I need to help him get his testimony back. <laughs> but, but that was last January, February. And, and life went on. We got busy. And he found a great job. And he's doing great. Well, I was having, I, I had dinner with a friend of mine on the 6th of October of this year. Okay, so with this other friend, this is, you the, never ended up having never, no, yeah, the but, deep conversation. Yeah, never had the deep conversation. You just, it was just in your mind. It was like, oh, someone left. Yeah. So someone leaving the church... Still didn't. No, no, no. This is what I'm saying. If we wanted to sort of do um, piecing apart how how someone's testimony can unravel, sometimes those just knowing that someone has left can be a bit of a marker in your mind. Not necessarily yeah. to move you in a big way, but it but it registers in some somehow yeah, that exactly and that's how I meant that's why I mentioned it because it was a marker saying how could somebody that devout leave the church yeah, yeah. now and somebody you respected absolutely yeah. someone I respected and knew was a devout member um, sadly you know Matt was living in Seattle we're down here in Salt Lake I don't know what Matt went through and I I wasn't really in a position to say how devout he was I wasn't we weren't that close talking about gospel topics as I had been with this guy. And so it, Matt leaving wasn't as shocking to me as this friend leaving. Yeah, sometimes you're closer to people at work yeah, exactly. than you are your own family. Oh, yeah, you're seeing them every day, yeah. you're talking about the yeah. church, and you're working at the church talking about it. So, yeah, so, yeah when, he, when he called me and said he, because he was still working when he left. So then uh, on the 6th of October. And this is two months ago. Two months ago. Ran into a friend of mine. <laughs> ran into a friend, friend of mine, and he tells me, um, Hey Clay, what, what did you think about the? What did you think about conference? Did you think it seemed like it was all about people leaving and don't research? And and I said, oh, and, and by the way, I had watched all ten hours of conference. <laughs> I haven't not watched all ten hours of conference for I don't know when. I, it sounds crazy now, but I just felt like that's what you do, and that's your chance to hear the prophets. Um, I loved conference, and I said to him. Oh, I didn't pick up on that. I didn't pick, <laughs> I didn't pick up on any don't research, don't that. I, I did not. <laughs> it's embarrassing. But that even that whole doubt your doubts thing. I remember hearing it, but it didn't register with me. What doubts? I have no doubts. <laughs> and and so I, I said, no, I didn't. He, and he was kind of hoping that he could do kind of an entree to where he, he was going to share some things. And he says, well, I, yeah, I thought it was, he told me, he says, I thought it was all about, you know, staying in the church and people leaving and droves. And <laughs> so, no, I didn't pick up that vibe at conference at all. I thought it was a great conference. And he says to me, well, you know, I've, I've come to think that the church isn't true. And that was a shocker. This is me. a different friend. Different friend, separate friend. This is friend okay. number two. All right. And I, I said to him, wow, you, you need to, you need to... You need to check your faith there, brother. I need to help. I want to help you get your faith back. Back, and I told him. I I said to him. I said, I just finished reading the Book of Mormon. And this true story. I had taught elders quorum in May, and the lesson in the manual is about the Book of Mormon. And I realized I wasn't making the Book of Mormon enough part of my life, and I, 
I realized that the first thing I do in the morning, my priority was check email, check work email, check the news, see what's going on. And I said, what a simple thing it would be for me to just read the Book of Mormon first thing before I do anything else on my phone. What a miracle it is. What a, love, what a great thing it is that we have that, the LDS apps. And so since May, I had been reading Book of Mormon every morning, first thing before I did anything. Didn't matter. And I had not missed a day. Some days I read two chapters. And I had just finished, I had just finished reading the Book of Mormon. And I, actually, I had, I'm going to show this. Sorry. I had borne my testimony at the beginning of October about the Book of Mormon <laughs> and about this experience. And, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, on, on, in Fast and Testimony meeting on the 1st of October, first Sunday in October, I bore my testimony about this experience of having just finished reading the Book of Mormon uh, the, the same week that my friend told me he was, he was having doubts about the church. And uh, I actually got this little note card in the... I won't necessarily show it, but um, I got this note card in my mailbox. And I was proud of it. It just says, uh, Thank you for your powerful testimony of Scripture strengthening in your, li- in your life in order to shoulder the world's problems. And that, and the, and that the order does matter. First... Order first, then emails, and, new, and then news and headlines. I, too, know of the benefits and have felt the strength of their order. However, your testimony has given me a greater desire to implement more consistently. And this is an anonymous card that I got in my mailbox. And I was... So, from someone in your ward. Someone in my ward. And I was so thankful that I had been able to help somebody with that testimony. I, I, to me, it was it's always about strengthening other people and helping them. And... You know, that's part of the reason I want to do this podcast. So, you know, this is the 6th of October, and he tells me, I don't believe the church is true. And I asked him, I said, well, why? Why isn't it true? And I'm kind of proud of myself to now for asking why, because I realize how many people don't ask why. They immediately say, I don't want to know. Pretty much everyone. Yeah. <laughs> we'll come to that part. I've got some <laughs> stories about that already. And, and he says, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm just going to tell you one thing. The book of Abraham. Look at the book of Abraham. It's complete. It's a complete fo- hoax. And I said, like, what are you talking about? The book of Abraham. <laughs> and I went home that night because it was late. And I went home that night from work and told my wife, I said, honey, have you ever heard that the book of Abraham's a hoax? And... She, we've had conversations when I come home from work late and I have a conversation with her she remembers them later but she was kind of in that stupid so we went to sleep and now you fast forward October 24th so it's two weeks I'm kind of ashamed that it took us this long but on October 24th I came home from Ward Council I'm Ward Mission Leader and, and I came home from Ward Council and she said hey we need, you need to look at this documentary about. She comes to you. Yeah. You need to watch this documentary <laughs> about the Book of Abraham. And we watched the hour-long, it's pretty well-done documentary. What's it called? I wish I could tell you. It's just, it's an hour-long, it's a, it's a documentary. YouTube. Talk. It's on YouTube. And I'm sorry, I don't know that. You'll send me, send me a link, I'll post it with the show yeah, notes. Yeah, because it's fantastic. It's well done. And, and it just basically talks about how they got the mummies and the papyri and, and how they're not true. And, and this was the first time that I ever saw the papyri where... The, the papyri that the church had, that Joseph Smith used, that's the, cut out. The head is cut out. The top part is cut out. And so Joseph Smith had drawn in a head to match the head on the papyri. <laughs> so, you know, now I've heard the whole story about it and how the, that that's just common funerary document. The guy's name was Hor. Uh, <laughs> it has absolutely nothing to do with Abraham. But at the time, I watched that documentary and it was pretty shocking to me. And I walked away from it saying, yeah, this, this is not true. And I know that people would say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter that they were used as a vehicle for inspiration. But you can't deny the fact that they're in our scriptures saying this is the translation. This is, you know, Joseph Smith had an Egyptian alphabet uh, that he'd written down. And, and he didn't know that hieroglyphics had been deciphered. So, okay, the 24th of October, I had put that on my shelf as the only thing sitting on the shelf, Book of Abraham. And we went to church that afternoon. And I, I'm a busy software consulting person, and 
didn't think it that book of Abraham sitting on the shelf. I got back to work. I went had to go out of town for for work, and I came home on Saturday, November seventh. And for those of you that remember, this was the time when there was all the turmoil about the uh, about the the church policy, the church handbook. Yeah, I remember something about that. Yeah, you you know that. Well, I had been out of town. I didn't know, I didn't know anything yes. about that controversy. And so we're having a conversation. <laughs> we're having a conversation in the kitchen. I got home that Saturday morning, and my son and my wife were in the kitchen, and we're talking about it. And my son says to me, "Yeah, I don't think that's right, Dad. I think when President Monson finds out about this, he's gonna he'll he'll fix it." That's how naive we are. And now, was this your, this is your son? This is my who, son, who's he, nineteen. Well, he, was he about to go on a mission, or did he... yeah? I'll come, let me come back okay, to that. Okay, okay. Um, I want to tell the story in this way because it, okay, if fine. I start telling about my kids, you'll yeah, think yeah. that one led to the other, and it really didn't. This was my personal journey. Yeah, right. In, then we'll do retrospect. Yes, please. Okay, all right. And uh, so he's telling me, Dad, you know, I don't think that's right. I don't, I don't like it. And, and my wife and I are both trying to tell him. She read a really beautiful thing about the Savior, and we talked about it. We, we just have an open discussion. But he says, no, I don't, I don't think this is right. The prophet's, the prophet's wrong on this one. And you're talking about the church. Is it the, is it the fact that he made being in a same-sex relationship apostasy? Or that the children... Yeah, the children. Were, the, the children the separating families. The children of parents who are in same-sex relationships weren't allowed. For listeners who don't know, yeah, that they point. weren't going to be allowed to participate in church ordinances. Well, all of that is pretty controversial. But really, the conversation we were having is how wrong it is to tell any children that they can't come to church. Yeah. Now, I was trying to explain to him that somehow maybe the church was trying to say that they didn't want to have missionaries baptizing the youth, which, you know, in hindsight, that's not a bad reason to tear apart families. If I was, if I was a same-sex relationship or gay or lesbian, I wouldn't want my kids to go to that church because they're going to be taught that I'm a bad person. But I, I don't claim to know any of this stuff. I'm not. This is not a topic I'm well versed in. But I'm trying to help my son understand that when the prophet says something, when they come out with a policy, you just go with it, and you get your testimony after the fact. I said, son, you you go down a bad path if you question the prophet. You have to just listen to what they say, and, and then you get a testimony of it. And he wasn't happy about that. And so, and he was heading to the gym anyway. So he went to the gym. And after he, after he went to the gym, my wife came over and she says, hey, I've, I've been reading this. Uh, you know, do you want to read this? And she's going to be mad at me for telling that because it makes it sound like she's the one that led me out of the church. But uh, the fact is she, she had been reading the CES letter. I had never heard of it. And I had been out of town. I've been working. And she says, hey, you, you need to read this. And I said, honey, I just want to watch football. I just want to watch football and relax. I just want to lay on the couch and relax. I knew something grab, you know, pretty heavy was coming. Because you got the book of Abraham, like, on your shelf. I got the book of Abraham on my shelf, and now she's coming to tell me about something with the look on her face that (laughs) this is serious. This is serious business. And and it's not her fault. You know, we started it because we started talking about these things, and and I'm thankful for her for being willing to research it and come to me and show it to me. And so, you know, I start reading the CS letter. And read about halfway through. And, and I'll tell you, the CS letter's great. I had never heard any of these things. Never heard of it. And, and it just came over. It just flooded. Just a flood of emotion and truth. Top five things in the CS letter that... Well, oh, boy. I, I've done so much research now, I'm not going to remember. But the things that stuck out to me, a reiteration of the fact that the... Book of Abraham is false. Kinderhook plates. The whole uh, foundation, the geography of the Book of Mormon, the fact that Joseph Smith was a, a uh, money digger, treasure hunter, that was fascinating to me. And, and in all, I'm somebody who loves history, U.S. history. And that whole, the fascination with the Middle East and the history of the Middle East was something I was well aware of. But I didn't know anything about a view of the Hebrews, first book of Napoleon, the late war between the United States and Great Britain. I didn't know anything about those books coming out before. A view of the Hebrews came out in 1825. Uh, I didn't know that, that, that there was all this, all this history. I didn't know that there was a, a, cult, a discussion about turmoil of religion. Oh, I also didn't know 
that uh, it couldn't have been 1820 when there was the turmoil about religion in upstate New York, because the church records show that that there wasn't an addition or a you know a decrease or increase until 1824. So the dates start to you start to see that the dates don't line up. Um, the multiple yeah, those, versions of the first vision. Uh, oh, the, oh, the, oh, oh, nine versions of the first vision. Shock to me. Shock. And, you know, all the polygamy stuff just came over me. It's like, wow, I, I knew it. My grandparents talked about polygamy. They, you know, it was just a part of the culture. But the deception and the, the you didn't know. What about the Book of Mormon uh, anachronisms and stuff? Oh, yeah, I didn't know anything about horses. I just figured well, there must have been horses, but people didn't know it. <laughs> I, you know, I never had a problem with it. And, and, but now we know that there is zero DNA evidence. In fact, there's evidence the other direction. There's, we know that 96.9% of, of American Indians are descended from Asians. And there's no, there's no DNA evidence. I love medieval history and ancient history. And there is no evidence. There's no coin. There's nothing with reformed Egyptian on it. They've never found any geographic or, or geologic evidence. Or, or, uh, you know, anthrop- yeah, there's no evidence. Archaeological. There's no archaeological evidence. Of the Book of Mormon. No sites, nothing with Reformed Egyptian on it that says, hey, this is Zarahemla. No. And, and there, you would expect to see that because in Europe, in Asia, they find this kind of stuff all the time. They just don't find it. Uh, and, you know, I was, I was blissfully unaware of it. So it was pretty shocking to me. And so, well, so back to the 7th of November, I finished, I read about half of it and I put it down, my wife looks up and she says, well, what do you think? And I said, honey, I don't think the church is true if this, tr- if this is true. And I, I'm, we're not paying our tithing. I mean, I was within, within days of writing the big tithing check and, for the year. And I was in shock. And I have been in shock since. And one of the reasons why I want to do this podcast is because I am probably at the peak of my shock, my, my grieving process, the anger. You know, I think I'm, I think I'm out of the anger phase. But this is real, and this is what people are going through, and I want to help people. And my wife says, wow, you're so black and white about it. I said, honey, things are binary. You can, you can break things down if they're atomic parts. It's either yes or no. Did Joseph Smith see? No, he didn't. He didn't even talk about it until years and years later. And then the vision, the, 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 uh, all the different accounts... You just, you know, you know it's not true. Could the Book of Mormon have been, given the dimensions, would it have been something that any man could put under their arm and run three miles? No. You find out that the witnesses, did the witnesses ever claim to see it, physically see it? We know that's what's written in the script in the scriptures. But when they were pressed, they admitted they saw it with their spiritual eyes. The witnesses are, are, are not credible. And they said they saw it with spiritual eyes. And this was the kind of thing that was prevalent at that time. The spiritual seeing visions and seeing things. So it was totally normal. And when you look at the history, you see that all of these evangelists, they all had some kind of a story about how they got their calling. And so Joseph Smith, you know, he had to have a story too. Well, you know, I got this, went to the grove and I prayed to have my sins forgiven. Or, you know, and all the different nine versions. And he was just tell he was just doing what the other preachers were doing, finding out that Joseph Smith had sent, uh, had tried to sell the copyright to the, of the Book of Mormon up in Canada. Shocking to me. So all these things it's either binary. Is that true or no? Is the Book of Abraham true? No, no, it's not. The Kinderhook plates. How how did Joseph fall for that? You know they were designed to be a trap for him, and he fell for it. They're not, they're not true. No, it's not. How could the church be true if any of those things are, are false? How can you have a prophet that has so many things that are false? And, how, and, and I just, I'm just overwhelmed by how naive I was and how unwilling to research I was. So this is the 7th of November, and I, I tell my wife, I said, we need to do some research. I'm not going to take the CS letter. And, and in fact... It's interesting to me over the last six weeks, like all the conversations I've had, the things that cause people to question. Everyone's different. For me, it was the book of Abraham. 
For other people, it's they read the Bible. I love the story of the, of the brother that read the Book of Mormon from 1830 and the Book of Mormon from today. Oh, that's another one of the things that I just brushed off. I knew there was changes to the Book of Mormon. Thousands of them. I knew that. But I didn't really didn't really bother me. Well, I'm thankful that there's guys like the brother that read the Book of Mormon from 1830 and read the Book of Mormon from now and realized that Joseph's view of God and the nature of God had changed. There's just so much out and there. And so they changed the Book of Mormon. So they changed the Book of Mormon to, to confirm match that. Joseph's evolving yeah. view of God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And <clears throat> and so from the 7th of November till today, I spend every moment that I'm not work and I, I I'm I've just been researching, reading. Uh, you know, the irony, I'll show these two things. This is what was sitting on my coffee table the day I read the book, the uh, the day I read the CS letter, this is what was on my coffee table. I was fascinated by this story. Leah Remini leaving Scientology. I, you know, like the sitcom she was in and just, and I thought, smugly, I thought, how could someone be so foolish to be in a, to be in a cult like that? And so I wanted to read her story and I did. And then I recognized some of the behavior, some of the things in that. And then the other thing on my coffee table was this enzyme. And, and I had seen this before, but until I read the CS letter, it didn't really sink in. This is Joseph the Seer. And it talks about, and, and, and it's really part of the church's inoculation policy. They're telling you just enough of the story about how the Book of Mormon came forth so that you can tell people that you've, you know it. And they showed this picture of the Seer Stone. Now, I'm somebody that loves languages and loves to study things. And I had never believed that Joseph Smith had translated the Book of Mormon by looking at that stone. I never knew that. I Let alone putting it in a hat. Putting it in a hat. I never... That, that was what? Putting it in a hat? What are you talking about? This is how I thought Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Sorry, I'm making it hard on the... No, it's good. There, but no, it's perfect. This is how I thought he translated the Book of Mormon because that's what the church tells you. Now, they can say, well, no, it's... Too, well, but this is not what they put out. And so, I've been studying... Since that day, I've been studying. I read the essays. And you know what shocked me about the essays? It shocked me that they have a whole essay about polygamy and they never mentioned the polyandry with the Sessions. Sylvia Sessions and her mother, Patty. Um, they don't talk about that. It's, it's, it's a lie if you hide the truth or don't tell the, tell the truth and try to do it. And this is what they do. And uh, it's polyandry. When you're married... When you marry someone that's married to someone else already, it's polyandry, and it's not it's inexcusable. And the church, the Book of Mormon tells you that, that that's not right. So, you know, I'm somebody who loves the Book of Mormon, and I always tell people that it has the fullness of the gospel. And, and today I would ask somebody, what, what fullness of the gospel does the Book of Mormon have that the Bible doesn't have? Get yourself to the Bible and read the Bible, because... Even Mormons will tell you, well, it doesn't have the fullness of the gospel because it doesn't have priests and it doesn't have the temple. It doesn't have all this other, other revelation. Because <laughs> Joseph, the Book of Mormon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mormon doesn't have that. Book of Mormon doesn't have it. <laughs> Joseph Smith was making this up as he went along. It, 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 it succeeded. I believe it succeeded well beyond his wildest expectations. And uh, so I, from, the, from the 7th of November forward, I, I just, my wife and I have been studying this. And so, you know, I was pretty convinced the church wasn't true, but I, I've read the essays. I've read church, um, church information and also information where I can get it. And I'll just show you one more, one more piece of information. I'm embarrassed that I'm someone who loves biographies, and I, have never, I had never read this until now. Tell us, the, for those not this watching. This is Fawn, yeah, Fawn Brody's biography of Joseph Smith, No Man Knows My History. Came out in 1945. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? How, how could I have not read 45? this? 45! Like, that's when World War II ended. Yeah. <laughs> how could I have not read this? How could we all not have read that? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I immediately got this. And for anyone who thinks that that's just an anti-Mormon book, I don't think Richard Bushman in Rust on Rolling quotes any source more than this book. Interesting. 
And she was David O. McKay's niece and a really respected historian yeah. to this day. So it's not like it's some screed of a, a cra crazy oh. person. Oh, she I was see. educated at the University of Chicago as a historian, as David O. McKay's niece. And just to go back to this Teflon, don't talk about things, most of us have lived our whole lives and have never read that book. Because no. it's anti-Mormon. Yeah. It's just truth. Yeah. You know... It's a good read, too. Where, where, a, are, you, are you done with it? or? Uh, well, I'm on page... I kind of skipped around. Okay. But I'm on page uh, 200 right now. I'm right into the part where he's talking about, you know, the book of Abraham. But I read ahead. You know, I'd, I'd read this paragraph. It takes, takes a minute, but I'll read it if, if you don't mind. Sure. This is a paragraph. Well, there's a paragraph on page 303 that talks about... Um, Well, I don't want to read the whole thing to you, but let me read this one because this one really spoke to me, and it speaks to, uh, it speaks to the whole thing, what was going on. I'll just read this one. In the spring of 1842, Joseph added to hit, added her to his circle of wives. Added to his circle of wives, her daughter Sylvia, who stood as witness at the marriage of her mother, also became his wife. But this apparently Patty never knew. She recorded her own marriage proudly in her secret journal, and from that moment forward knew her duty to the new order. So that's that's just talking about how Patty Sessions and Sylvia Sessions were both married to Joseph Smith, but then they kept it a secret from each other. And of course, Patty Sessions is my wife's um, grandma, great grandma. Let me let me tell you this. Let me tell you this story because it's fascinating and it speaks to the whole level of weirdness with, with polygamy. But a self-possessed 18-year-old, this is page 306 of No Man Knows My History, but a self-possessed 18-year-old English girl, Martha Brotherton, chose to speak her mind. Brigham Young, who had not been lax in following his prophet's lead, had set his heart on the high-spirited English lass. He took her to the famous rendezvous over Joseph's store, locked the door, and proceeded with curious, bobtailed oratory courtship that was become, uh, becoming so common in the city. Quote, Brother Joseph has had a revelation from God that it is lawful and right for a man to have two wives. If you will accept of me, I will take you straight to the celestial kingdom. And if you will have me in this world, I will have you in that which is to come. And Brother Joseph will marry us here today. And you can go home this evening, and your parents will not know anything about it. Unquote. When the girl demurred, and begged for time, Brigham called in Joseph, and who also urged her to make an immediate decision. Quote, just go ahead and do as Brigham wants you to, he said, and added with a laugh, he is the best man in the world, except me. Then he went on more seriously, if you will accept of Brigham, you shall be blessed. God shall bless you, and my blessing shall rest upon you. And if you do not like it, in a month or two, you can come to me, and I will make you free again. And if he turns you off, I will take you on. She said, Sir, it will be too late to think in a month or two after. Martha answered wryly, I want time to think first. To this the prophet replied, But the old proverb is, Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Finally and reluctantly they let her go, where she promised to pray in secret, or go home, where she promised to pray in secret for guidance. The moment she arrived, however, she wrote down the whole episode while it was still fresh in her memory and showed it to her parents. The Brothertons, in high dudgeon, took a steamboat to St. Louis, but not before they had given Martha's recital enough circulation so that everyone in Nauvoo knew it within a week. Eventually, Martha published her account in a St. Louis paper, but even before it appeared, Joseph had taken measures to kill the rumors her departure had set in motion. Now, I think that was important to read. Because people will tell you that, that, was a, that, that this book is full of lies and anti-Mormon. I'm here to tell you that is a creepy story. And it speaks to what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young were doing. And it makes me sick. It's, it's sexual predator. It's uh, pedophilia. The fact that he, Joseph Smith was taking wives 14 years old. It's disgusting. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be okay with the fact that the church is saying that that was normal for 14-year-olds to get married back then. It wasn't normal. And if they did get married back then, they were marrying young men. They weren't marrying 30-plus-year-old men. It's just creepy and wrong. And 
and it's, I'm sorry, but this is the kind of, that's just a tiny little bit of the research that, that's out there, that's documented. It's not anti-Mormon. It's truth. And, and I, I think I've said it before, doubt your doubts, but you need to research the dubious. This stuff needs to be researched and you need to look. So, I don't know, let me go on with the story a little bit about the chronology of how I told Matt and what happened. Yeah. So, on the 11th of November, you know, this, this is what's going through and we're watching everything on the internet and I, and I say, I've got to talk to my, I've got to talk to my brother Matt, but first I've got to tell my mom. We were planning to tell my mom, somehow my wife ended up telling her, and this is the 11th of November, told her about this CS letter. And, you know, she didn't want to read it. She knew. And, and, and I had to get mad at her to read it. I said, Mom, you're a lawyer. You need to read this. And, you, need, you know, if, if you think the church is true, you need to read this. Come to face, face to face with the evidence and tell me why it's still true. And this is where, you know, I'm at the peak of my anger phase of the grieving process. And uh, so, you know, set that aside. Her immediate reaction, though, was don't tell anyone. And, and I said, well, how can I, you know, she knows. That's, that's your mom's reaction. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. Contain it. Keep it in a box. And I couldn't wait. I had to tell Matt. So the next, you know, there's the 12th when I talked to you, Matt. And I couldn't wait another minute longer because I was sick to think that Matt had been by himself all these years being the one, the, the person who didn't know, you know, didn't have anybody else in the family that, that knew. And, and I had so much respect for him immediately for how he'd kept it together, how he'd stayed with my sister and stayed, just been a great dad. I, I said, I got to call him and tell him he's got a brother that knows the truth with him, which I did. And you talked about the, yeah. how the conversation went and I was just so glad to be able to help you and then my thoughts immediately went to how can I how can I tell my sister this in a way that she'll respond and accept it and she likes texting so I texted her and I said if you've seen this you know the CS letter the book of Abraham stuff and her reply back to me was well yeah I'm familiar with all that stuff she had been you know, I've been in Sunstone. Well, that's another thing that I was blissfully came across in my life, but I never paid any attention to. When I was in college, I did audiovisual. I had set up the audiovisual for Sunstone events, but I knew it wasn't right and it was, you know, didn't want to go there, didn't want to mess with it. I knew that my, you know, father in law had gone to Sunstone. I said, no, that's not for me. I don't want to mess with that. But I just assumed that my, as soon as I called my, told my sister that I was having questions, that we would have a, I, I pictured us having a conversation about the gospel and about these things that I'd uncovered and me somehow helping her to realize the church isn't true. And now this is your wife. This yeah. is Lori, right? This yeah. is your sister Clay. Yeah. And you guys have been close up until this point, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so I just think, well, okay, this is going to go great. Well, and, and it's not, and I'll just say, I'll jump in for a second. Like, you know, and by this point, Matt, you've contacted me and I know what's going on. Yeah. And it's not like we're all hoping everyone leaves the church. No. At least that's not, you know, what is it? It's, um, I, mean, it's I think I was like, stood and validated, as I said, right? it was like, the it's mic, the, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to come at it from a different angle because be, with Laurie and I, it had become something that was uh, impact. Uh, and we just accepted it. Whereas with Clay and the, you know, the respect that the family has for him and the recent events in the church and the news and all these things happening where I couldn't feel comfortable talking without it coming across as bias for me was going to come from Clay now for the first time. And I had this sense of, this is this could be something good for the family. This could bring us closer together. Uh, even, you know, even if we don't, we still don't totally agree or whatever. That we would actually have more open conversations because of this. That's how I, how I initially was kind of thinking about it. That's what I hoped. Yeah, I hoped, and and I knew that Laurie was somebody who was way farther ahead of me on questioning the church. I never questioned, but she's questioning the the policies, questioning the history. You know, she's. Well, basically, we had a text conversation back and forth. 
I asked her questions, she'd ask me back, and her final response was basically, I know all these things. I'm familiar with all this. She's a classic case of someone being inoculated, thinking that they know the history of the church, the church version, but not wanting to go farther, not wanting to go deeper. I, wouldn't you describe it that way? I mean, she doesn't have questions that are unanswered, apparently. I mean, this, uh, this she... does overlap what we were talking about earlier in the... I do have... I've come to terms with having respect for people's sense of what they will lose if they admit or go too far down this path where I'm their cautionary tale now. I mean, in a very real way, probably Laurie's experience with me made it less likely for her to ever... It, ever it made her journey different than it would have been probably if I because when she married me I was the strong committed member of the church the she was marrying someone like that and I think she wanted that and I flipped and went the other way and it was tragic I think it's still tragic and I respect her sense of loss so yeah in a way, I'm not surprised at all at how she reacted to you, Clay. Um, there's a lot of hurt that builds that has built up to this. So, and you know, once once all that stuff has happened, you you're not going to just easily let it surrender. You're not just going to say, "Oh, you were right all along." Oh, Clay, um, you know, since it's coming from you, let's have a conversation. After all. Yeah. How many years, Clay, had you had opportunities to doubt and question, Never and it doubted. just rolled off your back, right? No. Why would it be any different, necessarily? Yeah. And so this goes back to something that I alluded to before. Um, you know, what made the difference for you? And I don't know, you know, you've told me a little bit about your daughter and your son, mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about, you know, your friends, but was there anything about your daughter and your son's experience that maybe made you more open than you than you would have been years prior? I have to say, if it had, what made me open to this was the fact that the person who told me I knew as somebody, the person who told me that the, the Book of Abraham was false, was somebody I had trusted, and I knew was a good researcher. You know, he could find out things. You know, I know him in an IT context, and I knew he could figure things out. Whatever you told him. If you, you give him an IT problem, he would fix it, learn it, do it. And, I, and I, so I trusted him. And when he told me that, I was very open to it. Okay. Um, you know, well, let's, let's talk about the whole family experience. I, I wasn't, you know, you might look back and say, well, you were open to this because of your, your family experience. But honestly, I think my brain just works differently than other people. I was 100% believing I found out about the Book of Abraham, something clicked, okay. and I was willing to research more. Now, in the weeks following, I've had conversations with my daughter and my son, just in the last couple of weeks. I found out that my daughter, who, as a junior in high school, she's 22 now, as a junior in high school, super excited about the church. Christmas time, all she wanted was John by the way, anything John by the way. Over the course of that year, became disinterested in the church to the point where I was having to say, hey, you need to come to sacrament meeting. And, and I, I hate to think that I was the one being that, that person that was forcing the church. I have to admit I was. I didn't see myself as doing that. But I was pushing her to come back to church. And she had found out the church wasn't true because she's a smart kid. And in seminary, she was asking questions. She was, I think the first question she asked, or one of the questions she asked was, well, why can women not get sealed, but men can get sealed more than once? And the truth after is... After divorce, right? Uh, after or divorce or, or anything. Yeah, or, or death or anything. Yeah. And the truth is because, because polygamy is okay in heaven, but polyandry isn't? I, I don't know. The, the, the seminary teacher didn't have a good answer for her. And she wasn't someone trying to stump the seminary teacher. She's just a kid that reads all kinds of books and was super interested in learning and, and genuinely a good seminary student. And the seminary teacher basically told her, quit asking questions and have faith. I did not know that until two weeks ago. Isn't that crazy? She can't tell you that? It makes me sick that my kids couldn't talk to me about that. I'm sick about it. And that's what the church does. 
That's what it does because you can't, because you think, my wife and I have been sick for the last three years that our daughter has left the church. But I'll tell you what, and I say this kind of a cautionary tale and also thankful that we loved our daughter more than the church. And she got married this summer. We had a fantastic wedding for her. Loved her. It was, it was fun. And it was, it was a beautiful wedding. None of the snide, you know, you hear so many stories of people making snide comments like, well, it doesn't count because it's not in the temple. We didn't have any of that at, no, at that wedding. No. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, so thankfully, I was still devout, was sad that she wasn't getting married in the temple, but we, we didn't let that come between our relationship. And I'm, I'm glad. But, uh, you know, the other story is that, you know, in August, my son went on a mission and he was gone for four days and he came back. And, you know, he called us on Thursday night, said, Dad, I want to come home Friday night. He said, hey, just make it one more day. We picked him up on Saturday. And we just understood that he was too homesick, wasn't ready to be separated. You know, that's what we understood. And since then, I've come to understand that, you know, he researched things on the Internet and had some questions. And I don't want to tell, I don't want to say what people believe and, and what, but it saddens me how he couldn't tell me that at the time. He just had to tell us that he was homesick. And, but, I, but once again, like with my daughter, I'm thankful that from August till you know, the 7th of November, before I found out the church wasn't true, I'm thankful the way I responded. And this is why I hope anyone watching this is still a TBM or a still you know, full-on believing member of the church. I hope they will take this and know that your kids are more important than the church. I love them. I am thankful. My, when, I'm, when we picked my son up from the MTC, he was sitting in the lobby with another kid that was crying because he knew how his parents were going to respond. And he had talked to my son about it, how, how his parents were going to be so down on him. And I'm thankful that we picked him up. We took him to lunch. We said, son, we love you. We're glad you're home. But, you know, and me personally, I felt like Abraham. I felt like I was willing to sacrifice my son, but I didn't have to. And I really come to grips with it. You were glad he came yeah, back. Yeah, I was glad he came back. Now, he didn't believe me. He thought, no, you really want me to be on my mission. But over those few months, I, I got real comfortable with the fact that he was back. He, he tried. And a mission is not for everyone. Not everyone can go. And he might be mad at me for talking so much about him on this thing. He's private like his mom. But the fact is, he's a great kid. And, you know, this had nothing. Me leaving the church had nothing to do with him coming back from his mission. I consider it, and I don't. People are going to make fun of this, but I consider it a serious tender mercy that my wife and my two kids are comfortable with our belief right now. Thankful for that. Um, so many people. I mean, you know, my wife suffered for the 15 minutes before I would read the CS letter. <laughs> and, she, you know, you think she suffered for 10 years, like Matt here, 15 years. No, we, you know, we... Uh, you know, we figured this out relatively at the same time. Um, you know, back to the timeline. On the 12th, and uh, you know, I started t texting my sister. We're texting back and forth. And, you know, I'm asking her questions and she's just, it's going nowhere. And she's, by now, she knows that I am convinced that Joseph Smith is not a prophet. The Book of Mormon is false. And, and you know, my feelings about just how bad, how terribly false it is. You know, I've told her about the polygamy and stuff and... She just bore her testimony and said, well, I'm, you're not going to take away my testimony in Christ that comes through the restored gospel of Joseph Smith. I'm not going to take that away. And that hurt me because I'm not trying to take anything away. You know, wouldn't you want to know? And this is, you know, part of the way my mind works. If there's truth out there, I want to know it. I don't want to, I'm not taking away from you. I'm telling you something that, I'm taking a risk telling you something that is important and it's true. And I, and I, really know it she texts me back and says well you just need to know I needed someone to talk to so I told your brother Corey that hurt me because if anyone knows my family we know that my brother Corey would be the absolute least receptive person to this and that hurt me because she said she needed someone to talk to I thought I was the person that she would talk to that hurt me and so now I know that for about a day, my brother Corey has known that I'm having, uh, you know, you say faith, I never had a crisis. I went from having 
faith that the church was 100% true to knowing that the church was demonstrably false. <laughs> you know, you can, you can know for surety that the church isn't true. And uh, so it wasn't, you know, it's not really a crisis. The crisis is how you deal with it, I guess. But uh, So I know my brother's not reached out to me. I say, hey, Clay, I heard, I mean, my, that was my first reaction when I heard about my friends losing their testimony. I wanted to reach out to them. Nothing. So I texted him. I said, don't judge. Except you didn't reach out to Matt, really, right? No, sadly. So, I mean, you understand it, your brother, No, right? exactly. You know, I, and that's the thing. I, yeah, exactly. It, this, is, this is the craziness. No one's bad. It's just we're stuck in the rut. We're yeah. stuck in the mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And until you're out of the mindset, you're in the mindset. Yeah. <laughs> and you're taught that this is, well, I'll tell you what he said to me and paraphrase it. But I'll tell you what, what I said to him exactly was, I just texted him. I said, don't judge me. Until you've read, watched the Book of, Book of Abraham documentary and read the CES letter. Don't judge. I said, just don't judge, judge me. He wrote back to me, what are you, an evangelist now? That's all he wrote back. And I just told him, I said, you know, I found out the church wasn't true from friends of mine. And I've researched it. And he, said, and he wrote back to me, you know, and I want you to read these things. So I, you know, look at them. He says, well, he wrote back to me, they haven't done you any favors. Your mind's poisoned. I don't want to hear any more of it. That's what he wrote back. That's it. That sounds like something an FLDS person would say. Yeah. People that are smug LDS that think they're better than the FLDS or think they're better than the Scientologists, we're no better. We are no better. No. I used to think... Wow, how could the FLDS be the way they are? The Scientologists be the way they are? No. I'm the same. I'm the same person that they are. I just happened to have found out. So. So as I'm listening to you tell the story, both of you, um, I'm on the one hand just really grateful that you're willing to share and it's validating. I think a lot of our listeners are going to uh, resonate and, and will have had similar experiences and there's another part of me that's really uncomfortable it's like what's Lori going to think Matt she yeah. doesn't even know you're here doing this interview right. she's going to find out after the fact yeah. then you're here talking about your mom you're talking about your sister you're talking about your brothers like you're talking about your children and like there's a part of me that's probably still very Mormon that's saying we shouldn't be talking about this this is uncomfortable this is this could her relationships. And then what comes to me is like, well, that's just it, isn't it? That's the point. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Why is it uncomfortable? <laughs> well, I hope I haven't said anything that misrepresents anyone's beliefs. You know, no, I'm no, telling no, you what no, I believe. No, no, it's not that. It's, but, that, but it's, it's that, that just, I mean, why has Matt stayed silent yeah. with his own children for over a decade? It's because of this fear of what will it do to relationships to talk? And yeah. yet, talking is the only way yeah. that people learn and understand and can sort of get a, a better picture. Yeah. And so I'm torn myself saying, is this going to help your family? And yet, the point we're trying to make yeah. is what? what? Well, why are you doing this? Why are you speaking out now? I mean, you've already talked about it, but now you... You know, why, Clay, are you doing this? I guess... So. This could hurt your your relationship with lots of people. I guess I've always been someone that had a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty. It's part of the reason why I went into the Navy. It's what I, why I went on a mission. I, I feel a sense of responsibility to the people <clears throat> that I baptized in Brazil. You know, up until three months ago, I felt bad that I hadn't been able to stay in touch with them. The Internet hadn't been invented yet. But I thought, oh, I wish I could go help them. I hope some of them are still members of the church. And now, I wish I could go back and talk to every single one of them and tell them I'm sorry. I, the church isn't true. I, I want to tell them. And I don't know what it is about me. I, I'm not... Like, I have a lot of admir admiration for my father-in-law. He knew it wasn't true. Knew it wasn't true. And, you know, all he ever said to us, he respected my wife and me, and all he ever said to us was, you know, I've studied this and, you know, it's not true. Tell, told my daughter, you know, told my wife, it's not true. You know, I studied it. And 
I have a respons- I feel like I have a responsibility. I was a word mission leader until last week. I, I went around the world telling people to come to church and it's the true church and bear my testimony. And, you know, I wasn't lying. I believed what I believed. Uh, but now I feel like I want to set the record straight and I just feel like I'm, I want to live an authentic life, which some people hate that saying, but I want to be authentic. And this is a serious crisis because so much of my identity is the church. So much of who I am. Everyone knows. Everyone knows that I was in the Navy. Everyone in consulting, uh, everyone that I work with now knows I'm a member of the church. And they're going to think it's weird if I drink a cup of coffee at work or if I don't have garments on that they can see garments. And I don't want that. I I, I don't want to have... I want to be able to just live my life. I wish I could just live my life and instantly be not Mormon, but somehow retain all of the goodness, all the things that I think are good about me that I got as a member of the church. I want to keep those things. But I know that people are going to judge me. People are, people are going to absolutely judge me and think that I'm the worst person ever. And, and you know, we talked about this. My wife and I have talked about what I want to do. And I told her, I said, I want to, we talked. How are we gonna? How are we gonna handle this? How, I told her. I said, "Honey, let me be the bad guy. Let me be the one in the ward that is, uh, you know, not member, and you, nobody knows what you are. I'll be the one that's the apostate, because we don't want to lose all our friends. We live in South Jordan. There's like three neighbors that are not more, not Mormon. We don't want to lose all the all the close relationships we have, with people that we love and and care about. Now." Chances are most of them won't, won't watch this video because they, they know it's anti-Mormon. But I'll tell you what I did last week because I had I had to be honest. I I went and met my bishop. And I told him, I said, Bishop, I haven't been able to do my uh, word mission leader calling for the last month. And I'm so sorry about it. You know, I've been sick about it. I have to tell you. Um, I, looked him, I looked at him. I said, I'm... Sorry, I can't do this calling because I found out the church isn't true. <laughs> and and he was, you know, he had the he had a look a shock a look of shock on his face. And you know, he just he cares about my family, love him, love our neighbors, love our ward. And I just and I it pained me to tell him that. But I said, "Bishop, I'm here to tell you this because I don't want to just fade away from the church. I don't want to keep going and and not knowing it's not true." And you know what? I have a lot of respect for people that do that. There's people that have to keep going. There's general authorities that have to know it's not true, but they just keep going. And I'm not trying to tell you that I'm judging anyone. I, I'm trying to, if I was ever judgmental as a Mormon, I'm trying to be zero judgmental as an ex-Mormon because I'm fully appreciative of it now. But I just told him, I said, Bishop, I don't want you to, I didn't want, you know, I had a commitment to you that I was going to be ward mission leader. And now I can't do it. He says, well, I appreciate you coming to me. And, uh, you know, he asked me why. And I said, well, well I'll tell you. But I'm, you know, there's some things that you might not want to hear. And he says, no, I don't want to hear it. Well, I, I proceeded to tell him. Book of Abraham, CS letter, just the things about the temple, the same things about the Book of Mormon. And not, and not too much, you know. But things that he had, the, 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 the essays. He had not heard of the essays that the church put out to inoculate the youth. Your own bishop in 2015, was not November. Aware. And it's not because he's not a great guy. He's a great guy, great bishop. Not aware of these things. And, and to his credit, he was interested in knowing. And, and I think he knows because we've got a lot of youth in the ward. And I told him about my family and about our experience. And, and he wanted to know about it. He... Uh, you know, I, just, I told him it's not true, and he was as curious as I would expect anyone to be in that in that position. He asked me if I'd felt the spirit in all this, and I think that's a great question. I have felt the spirit, it's the same as I did it when I was a member, and I told him that. And that's what's so crazy. You you would think, oh, this is an evil. It's a dark, evil presence of God. No, no, the truth is the truth. And anyway, okay. left him with a word of prayer. I, I said a prayer for us both, and and I pray for him to now. And, and I know he was praying for my family, worried you know worried about us and cared about us. And and 
you know, if anyone, if any of our neighbors are watching this, well, we'll see. I, I, I just, are you concerned about being excommunicated for speaking up? I am not concerned about being excommunicated because I will quit before they excommunicate me. Um, it's uncomfortable. It's sad. It makes me really sad. I've shared a lot of tears because I, we love the church. We love everyone. But it's not true. And, and I, I guess I'm just this black. My wife keeps saying, you're so black and white. The church isn't true. Why would I, why would I worry about being excommunicated? What about, what about those who say, uh, you know, their entire podcast dedicated to this idea that it doesn't matter, that the church may not be true, but it's more good than bad, <sighs> that it's a great place to raise a family, that it, it gives you morals, that it, it gives you a great community, and lots of people will stay in the church and don't believe, I know. but just benefit from the, the, the social and the cultural and the spiritual aspects in spite of that. Why not do that? I have a... And most importantly, why, why spoil it for everybody else by talking about it? Why not? Can I yeah, say, that's a good I'm question. I'm just going to say, first off, because that's not the church's proposition. Yeah. The church isn't saying... The church isn't saying, go look at the net positive that's done. <laughs> the church is saying, this is the absolute truth. And your life depends on your loyalty to this truth. And your children's loyalty. And you need to figure out how to bend your will and your view of the world and all the things that you can't make sense of to match that because there's too much of on the line. Because this is true. You know, because that's the church's position, I mean, the, the prophet has recently said it himself. It's either true or it's not true. It's either the greatest truth that ever has been known to man and should be revered and followed and praised and, and bloodshed over and whatnot, or it's an incredible, horrific lie. And I'm just kind of paraphrasing here, but that's the message I grew up with. That is why I cared so much about it. Not because it, of, a, of a, an economic analysis of the net good and net bad, because if, if that's how we're going to approach the church, that opens up a really interesting conversation about net good and net bad and comparisons between churches and non-church organizations and, you know, ways of raising family and children and the, the, uh, what parts of faith are helpful and what parts aren't and how you should be actually picking and choosing instead of taking all the bad with the good because... It's the church. And that's not what the church wants. The church doesn't want that to happen. And so I'm going to respect that. And I'm going to approach this from the way the church sees it. Because I honestly, I believe Clay said this too. I believe what's good in the church is the people. And the church benefits from that. It benefits from people's feeling, you know, their love of each other, their commitment to their children, their desire to be good and what's bad in the church is the people. It's the it's our failings, our foibles, and and also what's bad in the church is some dynamics that influence those things to be more than they probably would be without the church. And again, that's again looking at it as a measure of net positive and negative, and that's not what the church is preaching. How are those who would say, "Hey, the church is more than just what the brethren think. The church is this multi generational heritage that we all own." Don't let the brethren define how you view the church. The church isn't theirs. The church is yours. I want to, I'll Go. say something to that. <laughs> I will say something to that. The fact is, I do have a responsibility to my ancestors and my kids and also the, my descendants. And I say the 200-year deception ends with me. Well, I'm, you know, I read a quote this morning. Uh, the, more you, the more you research, the crazier you sound to the ignorant. Now, ignorant... Has a <laughs> ignorant has a kind of offensive ter- thing. But ignorant just means if, that they are unaware. And the fact is, the more I research, the more crazy I, I know I sound. Because a, a, a Mormon that has never heard any of these things, and I start rattling off this long list of things, it sounds insane. How could that any of that be true? That's all got to be lies. And then, hopefully, they listen 
and they realize 90% of that stuff is to be found on in Mormon in Mormon sources. Um, you know, I have to read this quote from J. Rubin, President J. Reuben Clark. If we have the truth, it cannot be harmed by investigation. If we have not the truth, it ought to be harmed. Couldn't agree more. You have to investigate. Investigate. Doubt your doubts and research the dubious because there is so much out there that you need to find out. And, and you say it doesn't harm people. It harms people. When children are brought up in this church and they find out it's not true and they've been lied to, they get angry at their parents. And I'm not talking about my kids. I'm talking about stories that I've heard. Uh, it tears families apart. It's, it would be much better... You know, I've talked to a friend of mine that has little children. I said, I, my personal belief, having you know, adult children and looking back, it would be better for you now to take your kids, go to a Christian church, and, and be done than to raise them in the church and, and let them be told over and over again that Joseph Smith was a prophet, the Book of Mormon is true. Because they're going to find out one day. They're going to find out that the DNA proves the Book of Mormon is false. That Joseph Smith wasn't a prophet. They're going to find out these things and it's just going to, it's going to hurt more than it helps to just to, to go along with it. For the majority of uh, people who end up losing their faith in the church, they end up agnostic or atheist. Um, so you're, you're really new to this struggle. You're, you're six weeks into it or whatever. And, you know, you've met with Sandra Tanner already and we all know that she's decades resolute in maintaining her faith in the Bible and Jesus. But a lot of my listeners are saying, well, Clay, you're, you know, you've drawn the line at the church, but you've still, you're still embracing the Bible and Christ. And Matt, I'm guessing that you've, you've drawn the line a little bit differently. Yeah. And so Clay, I'm, you know, are you even open to applying that same level of scrutiny to the Bible? Or are you not emotionally in a place where you want to do that? I'll tell you what, that scares me. It does scare me. I'll, a little more about my history. When, when I was in the Navy on active duty, we, we were in Spain. And we went with Father Parisi on a Navy-sponsored church trip pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Been everywhere with Father Parisi. And we loved him. We thought it was great. And the whole time I'm thinking, wow, I wish he had the, I wish he had the fullness of the gospel. But this is great. <laughs> and he was a great guy. And, I, I mean, I have a testimony of Christ and, and the Bible that comes from external to the church and one of the friends one of my friends that I was a consultant with in Minnesota uh, I talked to him about the church he talked to me about his church um, I called him a couple weeks ago and I told him I just told him a story out of the blue and he says Clay I, I've been praying for you my church and I we've been praying for you for years and I, and I thought that's crazy I've been praying for you I was hoping you'd come to the church I thought we'd be having a different conversation and and he says no I, I researched your church and I I found out everything I could about your church, and I thought that's so weird. But you're, and, and it's going to sound self-serving here, but he says you were such a good example of your church. You were so Christ-like. You were such a good example that you changed my opinion of the Mormon Church. That's another reason I'm doing this podcast, because I have been living my life, being an example, testifying of the church, and now I have to set the record straight. All the goodness that came from the church, I'm thankful for. But it's not true. Find your goodness in Christ. Find your goodness there. And to Matt's point, you know, there's people listening that are agnostic or, you know, atheist. I respect that too because at this point in my life, I'm not judging anybody for what they believe. You got to do your own research. And are you, um, do you think that you will be open? Because people who dig deep into the Bible oftentimes arrive at similar conclusions about the Bible that they do about the Book of Mormon. Are you saying that right now you don't want to go there? You know, that quote you read about if, if it's true, if it's true, it doesn't, it, it doesn't need to be defended, but if it's not true, it should be attacked or whatever yeah. it was that you read. Do you, and it's okay yeah. to make that decision. Are you saying I'm going to build a wall around my testimony of the Bible and Jesus because I don't want to go there? I'll tell you what, I'm still finding out how false this church is, and I'm still finding out new things every day. Okay. You know, I never heard of Zelf until yesterday, the other day. The Zelf on the shelf? Yeah, uh -huh. I never heard of that. never knew the Zelf story. But I, oh, Zelf. The, yeah, the, okay. the, 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 uh, 
Zelf is the story of the Indian mound that Joseph came across when they were doing science camp. He digs out an Indian and says, this was a, a righteous Lamanite who was white, and he was, uh, his name was Zelf. And well, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I knew of the story that the Manti Temple was dedicated by Moroni, the ground for that. I knew, you know, upstate New York. So I knew all these stories, but I didn't know the Zelf story. But every day I find out more things. Second anointing. I was fascinated by the story of Tom Phillips. Honestly, I was so true believing Mormon. I just assumed that the brethren were meeting in the temple with the Savior. And I thought, of course they are. They're witnesses for the Savior. Of course they've met him. Of course they have. It was too sacred to even talk about, of course. But that's why the story of Tom Phillips is so fascinating. I never so you're saying anointing. there's so much still to learn about Mormonism oh, that you absolutely. don't feel the need to look at the Bible? Oh, no. Uh, you know, no. To answer your question, I'm still, I'm still completely... I don't, I'm only six weeks into this. Yeah. I'm still reading. I'm, and, still, I'm not satisfied that I know everything there is to know about this, the history of... Or that I need to know. I, I, I know enough now to tell you, I, I can bear my testimony, that Joseph Smith was never a prophet that he was a treasure hunter. I, I'm some, I gotta go another side, side note. I love geography, I love, I was a navigator in the Navy. I came across the island of Camorra in my map, you know, in the Indian Ocean, out by Madagascar. There's an island called Camorra, and there is a city called Moroni, port city. And I remember coming across that when I was in the Navy thinking, oh, that's fascinating, I wonder if it was founded by members of the church. <laughs> No, the rest of the story for that one, the Paul, ha Paul Harvey moment on that, the rest of the story there is the port city of Moroni featured in the Captain Kidd novels that were popular because he was a treasure hunter, he was a pirate, and those novels were popular in the early 1800s, and Joseph Smith would have absolutely had access to them. So my personal belief is that Moroni and Camorra came from the actual, you know, came from those names from those Captain Kidd novels that right. Joseph would have had access to. So many pieces to fall into place still. So many things. So I hear you saying it's just too early for you to look at the other oh, stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep avoiding that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. You know, I'll tell you what. I am somebody that I want to have my I want to have a Christian faith right now. Um, I'm, I'm willing to look at that. But here's the thing. I can at least know that there is a Jerusalem the Hebrews are real. And I, and it sounds sarcastic, but I, I find enough, the locations in the Bible are real places, the history in the Bible. There's a, there's a lot more real there. And, and there's zero, zero real about the Book of Mormon. Even to the point where they, you know, the food they ate, the, the DNA, the, the animals, they're just, they, they didn't exist. Mm -hmm. it, it's demonstrably false. So I find it easy for me as a believing person. Here's another theory I've got. I, I believe that through some kind of Darwin theory, the most gullible have remained members of the church. The most gullible mem people in Denmark came to the United States as members. The most gullible people stayed. My father, who I love him, but he's very trusting. He's like me. I trust people. I trust people until I find out otherwise. I think it's in my DNA. I think it's in all our DNA. You're saying you were gullible. Yeah. I, 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 find, I believe that the people that came here from Europe joined the church and believed. And a gullible might seem uh, well, derogatory, but combination of gullible and idealistic. Yeah, idealistic, trusting, and, trusting and believing. And I'm and just going to say, I think there's more to it than that also. Yeah. I think your psychological situation, your family situation, your socioeconomic status, yeah. your psychological state your family situation, there's a lot to it. I'm so a trusting person. I'm going to I'm gonna speak up in defense of, of believers and say that there might be more to it than that, but there might be something to it in some cases. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, because I don't want to offend people. I just feel like I'm predisposed genetically to be a believer, yeah. a believing person. And yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I, hey, that's me. I'm that yeah. kind yeah. of person. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Sure. Uh, I'm just saying, I recognize that about myself that I'm I'm trusting. Yeah. So Matt, what is we is it kind of come to the close of this uh, you know of this interview? Like, what are your thoughts? What are your reactions? Are there any questions you want to ask Clay? Are there any 
if you guys think about Lori and the future of the family, like, how do you guys want to kind of wrap wrap up our discussion? What, what what are some remaining things or thoughts or questions or hopes that you have? Anything you well, want to say to Clay? All, John, Anything you want to say to Clay? John, you're a great friend, and thank you. Um, and thank you, Clay, because I I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Clay. John, I... In just, this interview? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have sought you out to talk about this. Um, but it was just my sense of kind of uh, brotherhood with Clay that made me feel like this is the time. When, if not now, when? Is that kind of the question that had to be answered for me? And all I can say is I think it's a valid point that we talk about things that that will hurt it will hurt our it will hurt people um and i hope with all these things i hope we that we live long enough to forgive each other and i just want to say i i feel like matt and i are the kind of people that we love our family more than than the, than anything and you know we're going to get through this we're going to be fine and and if they do watch it, I don't I don't think they'll watch it. But if our family watches this all the way to the end, I honestly think they're going to say, "Wow, Matt has been going through a nightmare for ten plus years," and you know Clay is somebody that's thoughtful and didn't just his mind isn't just poisoned and he he didn't just want to sin. This is stuff is real and it hurts families. And this is why I want to say thanks to you and to Sandra Tanner and to. Bill McKeever and Tom Phillips. Jeremy Reynolds. Jeremy Reynolds. Oh my goodness, how could I forget Jeremy Reynolds? <laughs> Juan Brody. Juan Brody. Yeah, I don't, yeah, you should never start listing because yeah. there's so many people. And I, and I feel like I owe it to them to, to thank them for what they've done. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to become famous for this. People watch it. It might be a little bit of buzz. But then I just want to get in the back and just know that we put our testimonies out there. Speak your truth. Yeah. Share what we what we know to be true. And as far as your relationship with uh, with Laurie? Lor- yeah. Is that her name? Laurie? Lor- Laurie. Laurie. Yeah. I think they're going to be fine because she's a good person. She is. And, and you know, she's, we're going to be fine. She's, How about your she's, brother? She might be a little bit mad. My brother thinks my mind is poison. He won't watch this. So I'm not okay. worried about that. But the Are one I'm worried about friends? is my wife. I'm worried my wife is going to think that I said too much. <laughs> <laughs> and my kids, you know, they're good kids. But, you know, I've, I think I've gone on the record saying that this was about me. Didn't have anything to do with them. And I'm just thankful we're all together. Yeah. How about you? How do you feel? Do you feel like this, do you have hopes or feelings that this might mean anything to your relationship with Laurie or your children or... Extended family. I'll just say, <clears throat> I'm going to be okay with whatever happens, because for the same reasons Clay's expressed, um, I'm on my own journey, right? And I need to, I need to make some progress towards being more open about myself, about, and not, not. I mean, it, it may sound like I'm saying I, uh, I don't want to hurt my kids or. But really, it's about me. I don't want them to feel like I hurt them. I don't want them, you know, because of how I would feel about that. And this is a t- this interview we're having here is an opportunity for me to actually have said publicly some things that I've never said, um, except in a very angry and in a way that no one would that I love and care for could ever accept. So I'm thankful to Clay because he's just like I said, this is the third time in my life where Clay has shown up and been a extremely meaningful and important influence in my life. Uh, and again, what more can you ask for than to have relationships like that? So, but I do hope, I hope just like we all hope that, that, time will go by that we find our way through our challenges and that we grow closer together not further um and that we somehow 
resolve, come to some resol- resolution of our differences that we can live with. I, I couldn't ask for more than that. How about with your children? <clears throat> What's your hope? So there? I hope my kids will be. Do you hope they watch this? Yeah, I do. I really do. Do you think they will someday? I, I think so. I do. I I have so <clears throat> much. I have so much hope and faith in the in the next generation. I think. I mean, I recently was reading and watching the uh, Isaac Asimov. Is it? It's not Isaac Asimov. It's Arthur C. Clarke's uh, Childhood's End. Um, and so some of the over well, overreaching themes there are that it all ends. And in the context of that, why are you throwing away right now if it all ends? And also that the hope of humanity is their children. You know, we live, we don't all have children. We can't all have children, but our, our, as a, as a race, we have children and we push ourselves into the next generation for longer than we have ability to understand. And With that kind of perspective, I think I can be okay with just about anything. As long as I can go to my grave knowing I did everything I could to the best of who I am and that my kids have a chance. And their kids. So what more could you live for? To me, that's like the most profound kind of meaning the natural one the one that we have evidence for our existence that we don't have to make claims we don't have to hope that we'll be redeemed in some way this thing's been going on for more and it succeeds and we should take pride and joy and some consolation in that and live like that every day is kind of where i'm coming from so all right. Yeah. And so I just, Clay, we'll give you the last word. Well, thank you. And like I said, I this six weeks into it, crazy. Um, I'm when you find out true, false. Um, you just want to. I just want to share it. Just wanted this. My stages of grief, I feel like are coming to a close here. And I'm, I feel like I've done what I need to do. I've made things right with my bishop. He knows why I'm not doing my calling. And I feel like I've put this record out there to set things right with everyone who knew my testimony of the truthfulness of the church. And if anybody cares to look, they'll see why, how I know, how I came to know what I do know. And, and, and my recommendation to them is research for themselves. Don't even listen to me. Find out for yourself because you can find out for yourself. That information is out there. Research. Google's a good thing. And if somebody were to say, what do you believe in now? And I don't even mean religiously. Like, if you were to sort of have a minute to your children or grandchildren to say, well, that stuff used to be important to me. It's not something I believe in anymore. But then they were to say, well, what, what is important to you now? What would you leave them with as parting wisdom? A, a testimony of whatever you believe in now, not necessarily religious, just about life. I'll tell you what, it, it, well, it's in a religious context because, or you can say it's Christian, or you can say it's karma, but I believe that we get back what we put out into the universe. Be a good person. Treat others like you would want to be treated. Tell the truth. Be honest. Do what's right. Be true to yourself. And, and don't be afraid to learn things. And don't judge people. Now, I don't need to tell my kids that because they're, they're already fantastic examples of all that. They're, they're great. Um, but I would want anyone to know that that's, that's some truth you can hold on to. All right. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, Matt Elgren and uh, Clay Christensen, you guys are awesome. Have a little brother-in-law hug there. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thought we were done already. <laughs> Thanks for sharing uh, your testimonies. Thanks for coming on Mormon Stories. Um, I wish your families all the best as you guys work through this. As Matt, you go back and tell your Laurie that you're actually doing this interview. <laughs> tell her it's my and fault. Is... It's my fault. <laughs> that was part of the reason where I mean, this doesn't. We're still rolling. This doesn't need to be in there, but I'll just say 
why have I not talked to Larry about this? Well, Clay and I are like, we know, we were for, I mean, I'm like, beyond a doubt, things I know beyond a doubt. The, once you change your view of things and it doesn't, no longer is in alignment with people that care about you, their assessment of you changes. So Clay and my talking, I mean, his, the point when he called me, I was like, I can't be the one to tell Laurie about this, Clay. You have to tell her. Because Laurie will think, will naturally think that somehow I had something to do with it. <laughs> right? So we are, here, here's the fascinating thing about it. The church is built on this notion of affirming each other and and reinforcing each other and putting our arms around each other and and doing these things why would it be any different when you find out something else so why do we try to take that from people and just assume that they're just bad or doing bad things to each other because they help each other when they find out something that they didn't know before why is that but it's real it's true. Clay and I are going to have to talk to our families and there will no doubt be some degree of you guys kind of are in this together. And I don't know how that's going to play out, but well, I wanted to tell Laurie because I wanted to help your marriage. I wanted to help yeah. you. I wanted to have her know what I knew. And I thought she was going to be like, thanks Clay. I needed to hear that. I never knew she was going to. Yeah. So well, we'll I think it's really courageous. I think it's really important I think not speaking out, not being candid, not having those conversations is the problem. It is the problem. And all the shame and guilt and marginalization, uh, stigma that we label people with, that's all the problem. And the good news is, even if you're a Christian or a Mormon, you're supposed to believe in loving and, and charity and, and the golden rule, and so, um, and in truth and in honesty. So... Even this very act is very consistent with the Mormon values that many of us were raised with. So we just have to do this with an eye of hope that that good good things will sprout from the seeds we plant. You know, and not necessarily that everyone leaves the church, but just no. I think all our hope is just that there's more love, more openness, more support, more tolerance for each other. Yes. And then if people want to believe, keep believing, right? But but stop the silence, stop the shame. Stop the children or the spouse cowering, hiding, scared to talk, scared to be honest, hiding who they are from their children and people suffering and, and medicating in ways that they need to because they're dealing with so much sadness and distress. That's got to end. You're right. And it's only going to end when we talk. Amen. Yeah. Sorry. No. I'm not supposed to end that way, am I? That's well, beautiful. It's a beautiful <laughs> dork's right on of Mormon stories. Um, all right. So uh, thank you, listeners, for joining us uh, for this about three-hour podcast. Thanks to all those who financially and morally support Mormon Stories. Your financial uh, uh, support is what keeps us going. Um, please support us if you can. Go to mormonstories.org. If you want to ask Matt or Clay questions, if you knew them and you want to share experiences, if you liked or didn't like or want to challenge things they said, uh, feel free to do that, and uh, we'd love to have more conversations like this and continue the conversation online. We want to wish all you guys a happy new year, and uh, and we hope you join us again soon on Mormon Stories. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Take care, guys. All right. Thank you.